Um, so before we start, do, do we have any any questions about dynamic programming? I want to do a little bit of, you know, I know we have office hours. Some of you like office hours. Some of you do not, because I didn't see you there. Um, so what? Is there anything I can help you with dynamic programming? How about this homework problem, the latest one, that has been discussed over and over at office hours? What is the deal with the, so what do we have in that problem? <coughs> we have a ladder, right? So ladder has size. And we have so ladder size is n, and we have k jars to drop. Um, and we can break them all until we find so the time <coughs> is find the max. Um, where jar doesn't break. So there's a magic step <coughs> that if we put it here, the jar breaks, but if we put it higher, so let's call this a um, you know, uh, I don't know, Z, and at Z plus one, <laughs> jar breaks. So that's what we want to find. Where is the Z? Uh, the mini with minimum <coughs> number of trials, right? But such that, in the worst case. Uh, we still find Z 100%. So we, we, we want to have minimum number of jar dropping, but we don't want to risk <coughs> being in, at all being in a situation where we broke the jars, jars might break if you drop them from too high. But then we broke the jazz, and we still don't know exactly, precisely, 100% where Z is. So what happens here in a binary search sense, that is if you have a lot of jars, you will construct in the middle, because it's a binary search problem, right? And if the jar breaks, means I have to search down. If the jar doesn't break, I have to search up. The problem with this approach is that if you break too many jars, you still, after so many steps in binary search, you might be in a range in a ladder that you don't know where the step is. Because right? binary search cuts in half the search space at every, every, every trial. The problem is if I broke some jars, and all, all of them, and I, I do not have exact Z, then I'm in trouble because now I, ha I have no way to find Z. I have no jars left. So I, I was proposing last time a, a very naive idea that says do binary search until you're down to one, one jar. If I'm not down to one jar, binary search is clearly optimal, right? There's no way to, f if I have infinite jars, the fastest way to find this part would be binary search. There's no way to search faster than log n in a sorted array. And I could do binary search until I'm down to one jar. And if I'm down to one jar and a chunk, suppose this is my current chunk right here. Right? Suppose I, I'm left to these steps and down to one jar. What do I do? Start, Start to the bottom and try it until the jar breaks. When the jar breaks, Z is the previous one. Right? 
j breaks at z plus 1. So I'm not sure that's the optimal solution. Right? How do we think of an optimal solution? So I'm going to start doing this problem for you guys. Optimal solution like before, the part 1a. What is in it? If somebody gives you a solution, right, what, what, what's going to be in it? What? Right, but how would that going to look exactly? So how would you, if you have your solution, how would you deliver it? How would you write it down? How would you communicate it to them? Suppose you have your solution. Right? What, what would be the first thing in the solution right here? The minimum number of trials can, may not be a constant, maybe the worst case thing. But you know, depending on the, because it depends whether the gel breaks or not, right? If, I, if, I, if my solution is this binary search idea, how would that be written? The, the binary search until down to one jar and blah, 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 right? How would I write that? What would be the first thing? First drop goes to? So this would be a drop in position n by 2, right? Then, how would this solution look like? If it breaks, if it doesn't break, so breaks equal yes, what? The next step would be? Lower. by 4. And if it doesn't break, but if it breaks, I always have to check. Number of jars. So, is this, this if the number of jars remaining is at least two? Let me write down better. So, how this looks. So, the first thing is dn by two. Then, uh, if it breaks, k becomes k minus 1, right? I'm down to 1 minus n jacks. And now the next step is, um, the next step is, do the d n by 4 if k is still at least 2. That's it. If I'm down to 1 jar, I can't do this anymore, right? Uh, if it doesn't break, k is still the original k, and now the d is 10 by 4. But, but in here, my ladder is effectively what ladder I have? It's from n by 2 to n, right? My ladder now, the bottom size of the ladder doesn't matter. Like in binary search, I'm cutting my ladder in half, so I'm only the top part. So a solution is going to look something like this. Right? Try a, a step to drop a jar. If it breaks, do whatever. If it doesn't break, do whatever. The solution will have to be dynamic here, right? like in binary search. You can't specify the next step after the first one until you see what the result is. Like in binary search, I can't tell you where the next search is going to be until I see the results from the current search that will tell me go there or there. So now, suppose uh, th that's, that's uh, some binary search solution. This solution is valid, right? I mean, it's not going to break the jars until I determine <coughs> the find Z. I think everybody agrees with that, because when I'm down to one jar, I search the remaining of the space linearly. Uh, if you want to impress me, prove that this solution is not optimal. Find an example where, in the worst case, this has more trials than the whatever some other solution which is optimal. So we don't think this is optimal, but to prove that this is not optimal, we need what? We need a ladder, an N, and we need a Z. Now we have the creators of the problem, so we know what the Z is. And then we say the minimum number of steps in the optimal solution, worst case. I want to talk a little bit more about what worst case means in here. But in the worst case, I could do this in 10 trials. 
while well, this solution does at least 11 trials, right? Because not optimal means it does at least one more trial than the optimal solution. Optimal here means how many times I, I, I drop a jar from the lab, right? So can you find me an example where this particular solution is not optimal? Yes. Um, like in the case of two jars, if we have 100 runs, and uh, with binary search, if we go and it takes at 50, 50th uh, rung, then we have to go through 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, down to 50th. So let's see that. What he's proposing is he has a ladder of size 100. What this solution will do? It will break, uh, it will break at 50. So first, D is D50, drop at 50. Yeah. And he, because it's worst case, he, he can choose which way it goes. It goes to the non-favorable <coughs> case. So he is saying, if I did 50, you're saying breaks? Yeah, it breaks. Breaks. So the original k is 2. So now if it breaks, k becomes 1. Yeah. So then? We have to go through all the floors from Since it breaks at 50, this part is done. Right? I'm down with the other step. And now I'm here, my effective n, so this is, uh, if you like, n1 was 100, but my effective n now is on the 50 or 49 maybe. And then my effective k is 1. So this is one trial here, but then what's going to happen here? I need to search linearly for the bottom. I cannot afford to put this jar anywhere because I only have one jar. If I put it somewhere and it breaks, then I'm left to the chunk of search that I cannot search because I have no jars. So then in k equal one now, linear search, if I'm really unlucky, where is 40, 40, 40. This is the magic <coughs> Z right here. So I'll have to do how many searches? So total uh, drops would be about 50. So this solution, assuming worst case, why, why is it assuming worst case? Because if this thing would not break, that would be very good, right? As, as far as I could go with binary search without breaking the jar, that's effectively very efficient. So because I'm always following the worst case, uh, the problem with this is that it might break, right? And then I'm down to a linear search of 50 things. Why is this not optimal? Can this be done, assuming this particular position, a ladder of 100 steps, Z that I'm looking for is, say, 49. Can this be done with faster than 50 searches? Yes. If I would drop the first jar somewhere, higher or lower than 50? Lower. Low, lower, suppose somewhere in here. Why, why would that be a benefit to this solution? If it breaks, the linear search remaining to, to search is smaller. So I still have a linear search, but it's smaller. If it doesn't break, I still have two jars. So it's true that if it doesn't break, my search to space will be bigger, true but I have two jars. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So a bigger space for two jars might be an easier problem than half of it, which is smaller, but with only one jar. So in fact, where, where should we put the thing? If what the first drop, in this is a good example, k equal to, if I put this thing too high, the worst case will be what? Okay. It breaks, it breaks. Mm -hmm. and then I'm left to the linear, linear. search that's very long. If I put this thing too low, it doesn't break. That would be the worst case. And then I still have to just but a space that's close to the original. So I didn't solve that much of a problem. In every time when you do a worst case analysis, like as you're assuming the worst happens all the time, you want to balance the load in the possibilities. You don't know what's going to happen, but I mean, anything can happen, but it always, it's a worst case analysis, it's always gonna happen whatever's the worst for your solution. So if in this case, I, after I'm down with one drop, like in binary search, I have to search either up or down. The right place to put that first drop is when the load of the problems, the difficulty of the two problems is 
equal. Because if one of them is worse than the other, being worst case, it's always gonna go to the hardest problem. Right? It's always worst case. So if I don't put this in such a way that the two spaces are equal, it's not optimal. If one of them is harder, then that's what's gonna happen. But if I put in the middle, middle is not 50. Middle is where the problems are, are equally sized, right? Okay, so let's think about that. If somebody gives me a solution, this would be some D, D step T. Somebody says, you know, the solution has to be at step T here. And then, uh, depending on the brakes, brakes do something, does not break, do something else. How, how would that, uh, these are two sub problems here, right? We, we, don't, we don't know which one is going to be followed, but since it's a worst case, if, if, if I'm to write this as a C, like objective with a, with a dynamic programming, right? C will be the number of trials, right? C is always the objective that you're trying to minimize or maximize, in this case, number of trials. This will be a C of something, right? That's a problem. And this would be a C of something. That's what I want. And which one of the C's is gonna happen? It depends on the breaks or not. Which one? It depends on the breaks or not. But this problem is designed by my adversary. So my adversary, which is like God, he knows everything, right? <laughs> it will choose a subproblem for me. Which one to be chosen? The, the harder, which means the C, which is bigger, because I want to minimize C, right? So because this is a worst case analysis, if, if I don't know what, the Z could be anywhere, so I don't know if the jazz is going to break or not. What's going to happen here, in the worst case, it's going to be always choosing the bigger of the two Cs, which is the harder problem that takes more trials to solve. Who's with me so far? Good. So what's in it? What's in this C? N should be in there, right? Is Z in there? No. K, the number of jars. So if it breaks, what is this? K minus one. K minus one. And how much is the remaining effective ladder if it breaks? T minus one, I think. Because I put it as step T, it broke. So I only have to search now from one to T minus one. What happens if it does not break? And minus T, maybe minus one, I'm not sure. Yeah. Right? You guys have to figure it out. Because now, if it doesn't break, I have to search the ladder from here to here, right? Which is effectively of ladder of N minus T steps. And how about K? So, and again, because it's a worst case problem, somebody does it on purpose to be the hardest possible for me at all times, it's going to be always the biggest of the two. Uh, if it, it would be an average case, suppose somebody tells you, no, no, it's not a worst case analysis. This Z is equally likely to be everywhere. Like the probability of the Z being here or here or here or here is uniformly distributed, right? Then it will not be the maximum, will be an average, an expected value, right? because Z is likely to be everywhere. What would be the probability of Z being on this side? If Z is distributed uniform over the ladder, what is the probability of doesn't break or breaks? Probability of breaks is what? T minus one guy. Hmm? So, What's the probability that Z is below this T? If it's distributed uniform. About T by N. And what's the probability that it doesn't break? It's about N minus T. By N. 
about. I mean, you still have to figure out the exact. If somebody will say this is not a worst case analysis, assume Z is uniformly distributed, then it will not be the maximum between the two. Maximum is the worst case. It will be an average weighted by the probabilities of this to happen versus that to happen. Right? And I'll have to add in those things. But in the problem as stated is a worst case problem in which the maximum is going to happen, which is the most difficult problem. Okay, so there's a dual version of this, which I don't think is required for the homework, that looks at it in a, from a point of view of how big N can be, how big the search space can be, given a certain number of jars and a certain number of trials. I won't talk about that, I just want to give an overview of this problem to get you stuck. Okay, the other thing I want to talk about before moving on, if you guys have no other questions, so uh, the office hours this week will be today, tomorrow, and maybe Friday. My office hours, the TAs will be there, but I, I, I may try to be Friday there if you have some last minute questions. Um, my, my guess is like when I, when I had exams, math exams, when I took the exams, I preferred the last 24 hours to actually not study. I found it that if you study up to the last minute, you're so fresh on the last things you study that you feel like any problem that comes in will be related to the last thing you saw. You know? <laughs> That's not necessarily true. I prefer to have a fresh mind when I go to a math exam. Like the last 24 hours, keep my mind at something else, like movies or games or something else. <laughs> so when I go to the exam, I have a fresh look at the problem. It's not related to what I just studied. But maybe you guys are gonna study on Friday, who knows? Um, I can't promise office hours. I'm going to try to be there on Friday. Uh, the last thing I want to say before moving on to a topic that's not in your midterm. So perhaps, you know, we don't, we're not going to study very hard this topic until the spring break and, and further. Somebody give me an excellent midterm idea yesterday. Uh, I don't know if this person is in here today. Um, I think it was you? Yeah. Right. So what was the problem? The activity section. Right, it's like kind of activities. Kind of. It's saying uh, these activities from uh, A, I, or start I to finish I, those are um, all scheduled. So activities, uh, all scheduled. These are activities from start I to finish I. So obviously there might be some overlap. I may have a bunch of them here. This is the time, right, from small to big. So I have a bunch of activities, and I schedule them, say, at the conference in multiple venues. Uh, what the, the task in here is uh, select a subset of supervisors. So a subset of supervisors is included. This is I from 1 to N activities. It's some of these activities. So I want to select some of them. For example, I'm going to select this one and this one. The re the, the, what supervisor mean is that any activity overlaps with a supervisor. So I want to select few of those such that if I say you are a supervisor, you are a supervisor, anybody else who has an activity is gonna have to check with my supervisor so they have to overlap the time, right? So, uh, so we want that. Is, is this a valid supervisor set? Is it any activity overlapping with, with one of them two in here? Mm -hmm. Right. Yes. Uh, and of course, I want the size of I to be minimum. Like, I don't want to select too many supervisors. Can I do it with only one in this case? Is there a way to select an activity that overlaps with everybody? Four 
This one? Yeah. There is. So I could have selected this one, and then if I do this, every one overlaps with it, I'll have a set of one, which is better than a set of two because I'm trying to minimize this. Everybody understand this problem? So how do we solve it? Maybe on Saturday. Right? I, I, I like this problem. I thought about it last night. So add it to the list. You still have that list of problems for the meter? Yeah, put that on. <coughs> okay, so let's uh, let's move on. I, I know you guys won't study this because it's not in the meter, but we need to move on with the schedule. Uh, so we're gonna talk spend some time talking about data structures. And in here we have uh, the simple, uh, uh, simple data structures. Those are binary, so arrays, first we probably don't need to do that, list, we don't need to do that. I'm assuming this is all undergraduate material. Uh, we have, what else? Um, trees. Trees, simple trees. Uh, but could be binary, some of them. So I'm assuming you guys can build a binary search tree, for example. Uh, what else do we have? Hues. Stacks. Stacks. And heaps. Now we talked about heaps a little bit, and I think I forced you more or less to read that chapter. Heaps, heap sort uses heaps. So because we did it in class, you probably have a sense of how heaps work. Uh, that chapter was purely algorithmic in that it didn't discuss how to organize the heap data structure, or at least the problems were not about that. But if you pay attention the heaps can be organized quite well with an array index that controls where, who is the parent of who in a heap. So that's not hard to do. You should know how to do that from undergraduate uh, time. Um, so trees are extremely important in computer science, both in theory and in practice, to build them and to analyze them, especially binary search trees. Uh, we won't talk about arrays and lists, because they're very simple and we use arrays and lists all the time. So heaps are done. How about queues and stacks? How do those work? So just a two minutes recap. I, I won't spend time on them, but you have a homework over the spring break that says recap those things and do all the exercises in that chapter. But 12? I don't know. There's a chapter, simple data structures. And as a recap, we, we won't really grade that homework, I don't think. I mean, if you submit anything, you get the point. Uh, sort of thing. I, I don't want to waste PA times with that because this is undergraduate material. But I want you to go over those things to make sure a queue and, and a stack, you understand how it works. The, the reason we don't really need to grade it is because those queues and stacks will be used for graphs and if you don't know how to use them, you'll, you'll, you'll uh, blow your final. So uh, final, it's all about graphs. So I, I would say is a strong recommendation to recap those things because they're going to be needed later on. So how a queue works? Queue or is called first, 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 first. Okay. So what does that mean? The in operations happens where? Assuming the queue goes this way, where is the elements being added? Here. So this is in or we call this the operation NQ, right, of some value. So it goes in here. And when I get it here, I get it out, or we call this operation DQ. DQ, uh, DQ has no parameter, it's whatever it's in the uh, queue at the current time. Or null if there is empty, it says I can't give you anything, it's not there, right? So a queue is uh, in and out in the order that you process it. So that's useful for exactly this reason, 
as soon as I put an element in there, that's going to be processed after the elements that are already in the queue, but before the ones I'm going to add later on. How would you implement the queue? Like, okay, that sounds good, but how do you actually implement it? Would you use an array? Mm -hmm. Like, can I store the virus in an array and is that good or no good? Suppose I want to implement the queue, but my language supports lists and arrays and very basic stuff. How do I actually implement the queue functionality in queue and DQ? Right, so why not an array? I would have to move all the elements, right, in a FIFO order. Once I DQ something, I have to move all the queue by one which is a heavy operation if the queue is long. But in a list, if I implement this as a list, what is NQ going to do? Just add one thing here. That's easy to do in the list. What's DQ going to do? They move this thing here. That's also relatively easy to do. So I think in principle, I mean, when you see the problem you have, maybe you design a few specifically for that problem, but in principle, a list will be easier than an array. How about stacks? How do stacks work? I would like to draw the stacks this way. This makes more sense, but you, you can draw it like that too. So what's happening in a stack? There is a bottom, and in here, it's not F-I-F-O, Last in, first out. So what happens with when I add an element, where does it go? So this is the current top, right? And this is like filled with elements, right? This is values in the stack. So when I add something, where does it go? To the top. To the so this is in operations. When, when I take something out, also from the top, out. Uh, sometimes in is called for stocks, push. push. And out is called pop. pop. I could also have pop of a count, which is not just pop one, but pop six out of the stack, right? And if I ask to pop more than what's in the stack, suppose I ask for six, but it's only four, what pop should do? Hmm? Either on the flow or return those four that I have, and also says I only got four for you. Sometimes it's useful to get the ones you already have in the stack, even though they're not as many as you ask for. So this is a variable that keeps moving in a, in a stack. The bottom is the bottom, but the current top, if I pop thing goes down, if I add things goes up, right? We've seen that. How would you implement the stack? I think this makes sense as an array in most cases, right? Because uh, the memory would go in and out, of course, but I can, adding, it's only adding the next value, assuming I have enough memory allocated, and removing k elements, I still have to print k elements anyway, so by going in array down k, it's not an expensive operation. There are more fancy data structures for implementing things, but the basic one should be a list and an array. So uh, stacks and queues. Again, you guys are gonna have an exercise that says recap that chapter, simple data structures, and do a bunch of exercises from there. I think the homework even asks for a summary, a two-page summary, with all these data structures and the main points and all of that. There's some cute problems in there. Can you implement a queue with two stacks? Can you implement a stack with two queues? Can you do this and that? That's the simple <coughs> stuff. And what's the not so simple stuff? The ones that we need to do. There are two things that we need to do in class. One is today. Hash tables. And next will be red black trees. Red black trees are just like red <coughs> black trees, binary trees, but they have a balancing property. The problem with 
with binary search trees, they work very well if they're relatively balanced. All branches are about log n, and they're not so good if they are unbalanced, meaning there's at least one long branch. If they're unbalanced, they effectively act like a list. Most trees implementation. If I have a long branch and a bunch of short branches, this effectively acts like a list of size n by 2. Right? So a lot of the search operations would be inefficient on it. But if I add to the binary search tree the balancing property to every once in a while spend some time reorganizing my tree, then I, I can promise that all the operations will happen in logarithmic time. But I have to do this balancing when the tree gets out of balance. So we're going to have to do red black trees. And if we have time, we're going to do something uh, next, next. <coughs> Fibonacci heaps, which are a very fancy heap data structure. Acts like a heap, but has all kinds of very, very nice properties. Uh, if we have time, uh, because we have to do a lot of other stuff, we're probably going to mention this and uh, work a little bit with it. I'm not sure you're going to have a homework about it. Analysis of Fibonacci heaps requires analysis tools that you guys haven't seen yet at all. Like it's uh, the, the, to, to figure out how fast it is to work with the Fibonacci heap, like things like insertion, deletion, extract mean, we need something that most of you in 100 years have not seen at all, brand new. So we need to do that part of theory analysis first to use it with Fibonacci heaps. Okay? Um, so my plan for today is to start hash tables and to see how far we can go with that. <coughs> a hash table is one of the homeworks that you need to write the program for. And uh, the grading works by um, the grading works by not, you don't some, I mean you put something on Dropbox, you put your code on Dropbox, but it's like the first homework. Uh, you have to go to a TA and show your, your hash. You implement your own hashing, so you have to show that hashing working live on your computer. Okay. So uh, everybody knows, how many people here use the hash table ever? Everybody? Is anybody who never used the hash table? So what's a hash table? Right? Okay. So a uh, hash table <laughs> stores value pairs. Um, as in, let's say, hash from, I'm going to call it H from hash. I want to put curly brackets to not be confused with an erase. One of my favorite languages, Perl, uses curly brackets for hashing, right? So I'm going to say hash of the key equal the value, right? Say, uh, informally. Good. Uh, so uh, let's let's say first of all, what are the so? How can I do this without hashing? Here, here's a naive way of doing this without thinking about hashes. I can take a key which can be anything. Anything. Here's a bunch of bits, right? From bit zero to say bit sixty-four. This is where the key representation is. This could be a color, a person, an animal, a number, whatever. The keys are not, so very important here, keys are not necessarily numbers. But any key that the computer can use, it has to be written in the memory somehow. Right? So this is key representation, and this is memory. 64 bits. So here's an idea. Take this memory space. So I'm going to take the key representation and cast it as an integer on 64 bits. 
So it, even if it's my name in Ashji, B I R G L, or, or your name, or something, a sentence, whatever it is, I could take that bunch of bits that represent this key, even though it's not the key is not a number, but I can take those bits and make an integer out of them. Those bits are what? Those bits are a bunch of ones and zeros, right? And I can read that memory chunk as an integer. So then I get a value, which is a, no, it's an int integer number, right? Uh, I can call that key bar, which is take the memory representation of the key in bits and transform it into an integer by, by you know, normal reading all these values as an integer, right? And then, now my key bar, this is certainly a, a, a natural number, right? So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna use an array and say A of that key bar. <coughs> Again, the reason I'm putting key bar is because I'm reading that memory of the key, which could be a color or a disease or an email ID, who knows what. But I'm reading it not as a color, I'm reading it by bit by bit as an integer. <coughs> and I say that's the value. <coughs> right? Can I do this? You ever seen these keys that look funny? Like Virgil dot six one seven eight two five three two zero one dot I don't know uh, one hundred one Smith Avenue. It's like people concatenating a bunch of things and make out of that an ID. By the way, that's not my phone number. It's not my address. <laughs> uh, or, or, or IDs like 1807.3652.209. Just all kinds of IDs people use for keys. And every system has a way of designing their own IDs. Sometimes the first four digits correspond to something, the middle digits correspond to, I don't know, course that you take and the last digits correspond to your, uh, I don't know, serial number, who knows what, right? <coughs> yeah, uh, in the phone numbers, the 617 corresponds to area code and so on and so forth. The zip codes work this way. Sometimes those ideas are a combination of letters and digits. But everything that I wrote, whatever this is, I can write, I can read those bits as a long integer if I want. So suppose I do this. Any ID that's given to me, I take the bits. If I may, I may need more than 64 bits, right? If IDs are like that, that will take more than 64 bits to write down, right? Because if I write characters, how many bits I need per character? Hmm? Four characters? I mean, it depends. <coughs> Typically, how many ASCII code writes a character on how many bits? Five. Oh, five. One. Okay. So in ASCII code, how many bits are for every letter or, or character? Eight. 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 So if I have an ID that can have, say, 15 characters, how many bits do I need? 120 bits. So I may need more than 64 bits. Maybe this is 128 bits. If I, if, I, if I have long strings, right? Okay? But I, I could have probably, m most systems designed like this, they'll have a maximum set of characters, which means a maximum number of bits, right? If somebody wants to have IDs that are up to 30 characters long, 30 times 8, that'll be 240 bits long. So I can have 256 bits for my ID. And then for keys. And then those keys could be represented as 256 bits in teachers. So suppose I do this, that's gonna work, right? What's the problem with this? So I, 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 this is perfectly valid in terms of doing stuff with it, but it's very inefficient, why? Suppose each one of you has an ID like that, name, phone number combined. It's up to 256 bits 
which means up to how many bytes? 32 bytes, maybe, right? So I take those IDs written in memory, I just I ignore whatever they mean, ASCII codes, or I read them as bit by bit as integers, and I say for each one of you, I store that key as an integer, that, that in here is an index. It's an array index, right? This is an array notation, so when the key is something, I use that location to store whatever your salary or your grades or whatever I want to store. Suppose I do that. Why is this, well this works, why is it extremely inefficient? What's the key range? Right? If I use an array, I have to allocate the array for the entire range, right? Yeah. An array, when you say allocate an array, you have to have the indexes from one to the maximum index that you're planning to use. Right. Even though you don't use the middle values of the array, right? In an array, maybe I'm only using some values here, some value here, some value here, and some value here. I still have to allocate the whole array. Right? So what's the key range as, as read those bits as an integer, unsigned integer? It's from zero, right? Because I'm reading the bits in an unsigned form, whatever those bits represent. To what? To what, what power? 256, right? Because I have 256 bits. So this will not even fit in any memory. Just allocating this array is not possible. Because 2 out of the power 256 is way too big for even a supercomputer doesn't have that much RAM. So the range is way too big. What's another problem? Even assuming I could define such an array, I have that much memory. So assume I can build this gigantic array. How many values in the array I'm actually going to use? Only the ones that have IDs, right? So suppose I have I'm Northeastern University. How many students are at Northeastern University? 50,000 students, right? So how many cells I'm going to use? 50,000 cells for each ID. But my array has been allocating memory for like a gazillion number of students, right? The, the range allocated is, is huge compared to the how many values I'm going to use in practice. So the other problem, the one is way too big, the number of keys used is very, very sparse. As in, the, if you look at proportion of how many keys are being used, meaning how many indexes corresponds to student IDs versus how big the allocation of the array was, that's going to be a 0.000001 maybe ratio, right? Who's with me? Good. So do we understand those two things? First of all, if I define a range like that, even with 64 here, 2 at 64 is a huge number. And even if I could, I cannot allocate that to normal computers, but even if I could allocate it, I'm not going to use that much of it. See, I don't have 2 to the 64 keys to store. Okay. But this, in some problems, may be the right thing to do, right? Suppose I do this for phone numbers. So I, I'm, I'm saying the keys are phone number. What's going to happen for phone numbers? What's the range? If I read, start reading them as integers, right? So how does the phone number look like? 617-825-3201. I'm not hitting anyone with this phone number for real. I just made it up. Right. So if I use if I use this as an integer, cast to an integer, what's the range? If I really use integers that way, it's from zero to how many? That's the biggest phone number one can get. Nine 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 nine. So that's ten to the. How many? 
Then to the ten. Minus one, but that's fine. Ten to the ten, roughly the range. So how much is ten to the ten in English? Ten, ten billion. So my range will allocate an array that's ten billion in size. Is that okay? No, hold on. Like, like for real, what, what's the memory space of a decent workstation today? How, many, how much RAM do you get when you buy a workstation? Not, not a laptop. Say you buy a workstation. 64 GB of RAM, right? Laptops have 32 now. Right? So you get 64 GB of RAM, and uh, each value being an integer, so I have 10 billion of them, but how many bits do I need to store one of those? In general, when you store integers, how many, if you have a range, how many bits do you need to store all these integers? Oh, that number depends on how big the numbers are, right? If I use eight bits, I can store only the range from zero to 256. If I have 10 billion range, how many bits do I need per value? Did this at least twice. Yeah. In general, if no. the numbers are from zero to max, no. we need no. log of that, right? So I need log of 10 billion bits per T, right? T bar, because this is now read as integers. So how much is log of 10 billion? So that's 10 log 10, right? Log base two, this is log base two. Log base two of 10 is roughly 3.1 or something like that, right? So that's about 30. 30 bits, say 32 bits. So four bytes each. Four bytes each times 10 billion. So this is bytes, this is billion. How much RAM is this? How much is a billion bytes? How much is a million bytes? How much is a thousand bytes? One kilobyte. How much is a million bytes? One megabyte. How much is a billion bytes? One gigabyte. So I have 40 billion bytes. That is? Not impossible. I could do this with a workstation, right? But do you really want to just to store a bunch of phone numbers, define a 40 gigabytes array? Probably not. If you are Verizon or AT&T, would you use a 40 gigabyte array to define phone numbers? I don't know. When is this, when is this reasonable? Like this is certainly possible with a modern workstation, say 64 GB or 128 GB. It would be reasonable if all phone numbers are actually in use. If most of phone numbers are in use, then I really have that many IDs, right? I need that much memory anyway to store them. So if you are Oracle, you have to deal with this kind of problems because people who have huge databases to store. And you have to start thinking of distributed systems and so on and so forth. Oracles do, do deal with databases that have 10 billion records in them easily, right? And then I need to store that properly. So in some cases, open addressing, that's how this is called, it makes sense because I do have 10 billion IDs and I store them as integers, which are the phone numbers anyway. Some companies do that. They use your email or phone number as your ID. And it's not a big deal because um, if you're Amazon, would you use this as ID in open addressing way? How many customers Amazon has? Make a guess. Too many. Huh? Too many? How many? <laughs> I don't think they have two billion. <laughs> two billion mean every one in three people have Amazon when come in the world, right? I don't think that's true. Maybe they have 200 million. Would it make sense for them to use phone numbers IDs to get a 10 billion range for 200 million customers? Probably not, right? It seems to be. Okay, 
So I think we understand that. So there's some problems in here. Um, there's also some conversion problems. Sometimes interpreting those keys that are natural keys as numbers, just by I, I propose reading the memory as in bits as an integer, may create IDs that are no natural IDs. The advantage on the phone numbers is that if I read this as an integer, I can that actually makes sense. I see the number, then I can say that's actually somebody's phone number. But if I read colors or people's names as integers, bit by bit, those integers will make no sense at all. Like I cannot interpret the keys as, I don't know who that key is, right? I need another lookup table to see, okay, who is this person? So what do we do? What do we do? Let's keep this idea. So you're gonna have to implement a hash table, like as in not use a hash table that's built in in your language. You have to implement the data structure and all the operations with it. So hash table. Key is not a memory read of the key, right? So what we said here, the key index, key bar, was just read this memory piece as an integer, because you go by the bits and you create an integer out of them. Any, so, any, any sequence of bits can be read as an integer, right? Instead, we're going to say we use a function h called hash function of the key or key representation to be exact. The reason I say this is because we, we of course, going to abuse notation and call it h of a key. But really, depending on what the key is, you're going to have to use the memory representation of that key to compute this function. This is, like before, an integer. So my hash function has to produce an index. So you have to think of this as an index. But we want to solve those two problems that we have here. Number one, we don't want a range that's that big. Like if you transform something on 64 bits naively into integers, you get a gigantic range. We want to control the range. So we want the range to be controlled from, say, 0 to max. The other thing that we want to control, what was the second problem? In here, we may have a particular distribution problem. Like those could be very sparse, or maybe they could be all in one part of the array. So we want to control the distribution of H of keys. Keys, of course, come whatever they are. They may be color, people's diseases, uh, flags, whatever people have to store the keys. But H of keys is the result of the hashing. How does this distribute in range 0 to max? <laughs> so we want to control the range. And we want to control, OK, when you start hashing keys, say hash colors. Uh, you can still think of 0 to max as this, uh, we're going to call this a catalog. And when a key comes in, what, what index is it stored at? H of key. H of key is the index at which this is stored, right here. Right? So there's indexes here. This is from zero to max. And every time I have a key, it could be a color, a person, could be this ID right here. Right? Any anything I want, words maybe, or or bigrams or whatever. Anything that can be written in memory somehow in a computer memory. I'm not going to store it as an integer. I'm going to store h of key, which is my index, an integer between 0 and max. 
So this is what we want to do. You typically, this is a design from the very beginning range. Max is knowing, is designed in advance, knowing that I deal with, say, Northeastern University students, and I have 50,000 of them, plus some 20,000 alumni, plus maybe some thousand coming next year. I can design in advance what would be a reasonable max for this, 100,000. So typically, the max is big given the problem size. If I deal with physics experiments or weather experiments, those are very big. Maybe I choose a max of 10 million or something. Right? So I choose typically max is a choice based on domain and data specific that has some problem. Right? How about the distribution? One problem with the distribution was sparsity, aka we don't want a lot of slots here to be empty or not used. So we don't like empty or not used. Let's call this catalog somehow, let's call it H. Um, that's not good, H is the hash. Call it uh, A, like that one there. Because it's an array, really. This is a, a, a catalog, which is simply an array. So this is an array here. So what I mean in the array A, we don't want to have a lot of spots that are not being used. Another problem that's introduced before, because What's happening here, max is typically a lot smaller than what I got here for the range, right? That was one of the purposes. In here, when I read two different representations, so I have my ID and his ID, and they both name times phone number times whatever. Can I get the same representation for two different IDs? No, because if they are the same representation, they got to be the same ID. Right? I don't have a problem with looking at the bit IDs and say, okay, I have this bits representation of the ID, and that's two different IDs with the same representation. But in here, it's possible that H of some key one is equal with H of some key two. Possible meaning, sometimes it's not possible by design. Sometimes people design a hash function that will never have this property. That's good. Sometimes we design a hash function that may have this. This is called what? Collision. If I have collisions, what happens, my ID and his ID are both stored at the same index. So I have to manage that somehow. Because I, I have to be able to say which is that student. I can't put my grades on his uh, you know, <laughs> column or something like that. Right? So that's possible, but it's not always the case. So it's not like all hashes have solutions. <coughs> Some do, most of them do, and they have to deal with them. If I have collisions, then what distributional property do you think I want to have? Assuming my function is possible to have collisions. How do I want these collisions to happen? So I have 40,000 Northeastern University students. My hash has 10,000 slots. There will be collisions. They have to be collisions. This is called pigeonhole principle, right? You have 40,000 things that you hash into 10,000 slots. Some of them will be hashed in the same slot, right? So how would I like the collisions to happen? Distributed. I would like the collisions to be distributed. I wouldn't like 20,000 collisions to come to one slot and then the other ones have almost no collision at all. Right? So in here, if that's true, then we want collisions uh, distributed. as uniform as possible. It doesn't 
doesn't have to be perfectly uniform. I don't mind if one slot has three collisions and the other one has five collisions. What I mind is one slot has 10,000 collisions. That's a problem. Uh, so as uniform as possible or roughly uniform. Makes sense so far? So what's my plan of action here? I get, I get my IDs, which could be anything. They have some memory representation. I have a function that I'm calling that function to get the index in my catalog. The index is an integer from zero to max. And in here, I actually have to store the value. Right? So far, I didn't deal with the values. So far, I've only hashing what? The keys. So how do I store that? If these maps here, I'm going to create some sort of list or, or some data structure that I'm going to actually store what? The key and the value. I don't want to store just the value. Because this, what happens if I want the actual key? If I look in here, I get H of the key. But H may not be an easily reversible function. So from key to H of key, that's computing H. But from H of key to the key, suppose I want to reverse this operation. If somebody gives me an index, what key was in there? That's not an easy thing to do. In fact, we can prove that any hash function that is reversible easily has terrible hashing properties. Are you guys with me? If I want a hash function to be efficient for hashing, it probably doesn't have the reversible property that I always want from key, from the original key, or this key, to get easily to H of key. So this has to be an easy operation. <coughs> what? Get the key and compute H of the key. That's called hashing, right? And how fast do we want this operation to happen? We want to be able to compute the hash of a key instantly. But to do that and to organize data properly, the reverse operation is hard, usually not possible. The trivial example for not being possible is if I have collisions, right? If I have collisions, several keys got hashed to the same index, it's impossible to look at that index and to know what key you're talking. You, maybe you can generate a whole set. You get an index and say the possible keys that map here are the following ones. Maybe, but you couldn't tell exactly which one of these is, right? So that's why we store the key every time we store something, not just the value, but the key. So what happens if I have another key, <coughs> say this is key one, this is h of key one, which is equal as h of key two. What happens if I get another key value pair that hashes to the same value? I'm gonna create another block, right? So I'm gonna say, okay, store there, key two, value two. This only happens if h of key one is the same as h of key two, if I have a collision, right? Okay, that in a nutshell is how hashing works. That, that's the absolute fundamental that you have to know about hashing. I have some keys, I wanna map them to indexes, I want to control the range of the indexing, and that's a catalog, and the distribution in there. So I don't want, if I have collisions, all of them to come to one place. And how would I insert things? Well, what's my, how do I store something? Somebody gives me a new key value pair, what do I do? Computer hash, go to this index, and then I have to look for it. Right, so what are the operations that are needed here? This, uh, so operations. One is the obvious one, compute H of key. That's a hashing operation, right? Then look for key in the hash. It may, it may be like once I compute the index, that's not exactly saying do I have the key or not, right? 
because I may have few keys here that map to that index, and I have to see if the key that I have is one of those in here. Right? So look for that, and then uh, suppose I'm doing an update or an insertion. Once I found it, maybe do an update. If I don't find it, I may do a insert or add. Uh, and maybe I do a delete, right? Maybe the operation I, I'm looking for is to delete a key from the hash. What else can I do? Pretty much that's it, right? Maybe there's some other operations later on. So which one seems complicated? Hashing, we say we want to hash that's all of one. Uh, we hope there's some mathematical formula here that will save the day. Uh, once I found the key, how do I do update? Update what? Right. The value, typically, right? So uh, that's easy, right? Once I have this memory location, I just write a new value in there. Or add one to the existing value if I do counts, for example. How about the insert delete? That depends on what is this. What kind of data structure? This is an array, the catalog, but what this should be to facilitate insertions, additions, and deletions. This is easy if the keys are in a list chain. We say lists in general, lists are usually chain, but for hashing, the first people who thought about hashing were not computer scientists, so they call it chaining. So then the name is list chaining, chaining lists, chaining pointers, lists with chaining. It's like a left in obsolete, you know, legacy type of chaining. You see chaining is really a linked list, but because the another computer scientist who figured this out first, the name chaining is still there. <coughs> so that's why you're gonna see a lot of this name chain. But everybody sees this, insertions, addition, deletion would be easy if this is a linked list, right? Because I found the value, if I want to delete it, I just point to the next one, erase this memory. If I want to add something, I can choose whatever to add it very easily. I can add at the end of the list. I can add in the beginning of the list. I can add in the middle of the list if I want to. The only problem with lists, which is the general problem with lists, is that if you look for anything in the list, what do you do? You have to traverse from the top. So every time you use a list, you should know that all operations of the list include the part that says start from the top, keep going. There's no way to avoid that if you use lists. Like if you're hoping for some sort of binary search, these are numbers and they want to search. Uh, lists won't do that. But you may imagine you generate some sort of tree or heap in here, some other data structure that works better for whatever it is that you're hashing. Like lists are not the only way, it's a typical way to do hashing, but you can have a different data structure here, like a binary search tree, for example, that acts in some sense like a list, but has nice search properties sometimes. So this is not fixed in stone. This is fixed in stone. This is always a catalog. It's an array of indexes from zero to max. But what, how you represent your keys starting at a certain entrance, that may depend on the problem data you have. So now, what is this? What you store in here at this index? H of key, remember my notation for arrays? The index goes outside. So H of key is really outside because H of key is the index. What goes in here? What value? There is no value here. The value has been starting with the pairs. What is the pointer? pointer. That's the pointer, pointer to the first thing, right? So that is a memory pointer. Pointer to the first thing. So H of key is the index. That is position 12. So this A of 12 is a pointer to the first key value pair. What if I don't have anything in this list? Like it's empty. What would A of 12 be? No. No. Right? It could be no. 
that no means there is no key. So if this is no, if a of 12, if h of a key gives me 12 and 12 <coughs> is no, it means what? No key value stored yet with h of key equal 12. Who's with me? So you got to understand the basic hashing mechanism. It's absolutely critical. I know you use hashes very comfortably, and you trust Java or Python or Perl or anybody to, to do the right thing. <laughs> I get that. And I, I'm not expecting a programmer every time you use a hash to try to figure out how hashing works. But as algorithms, you know, and as more than programmers, you have to have a sense of what's happening in the back of the hash. Not all hashing operations are O of 1, for example, and you have to know why. Okay, uh, so that should be easy if I have a list or some fancy other data structure. That's easy, easy. Uh, H of key depends on the H function to be O of 1. We really want it to be O of 1. How about this? That's certainly not O of 1, right? So actually, this is two cases. A successful search. What's a successful search? The key is in there. Uh, can a key appear in multiple places in here? A particular key, can it be in this list and in this list? No. Why not? Hash of the key, it's a deterministic index. Can a key be twice in this list, in a one list? Usually not, but that's really depending on how you organize your list data. If you really want, every time you see the same key, not to store it there, perhaps if you store, you want to store several values for the same key, then you don't really want to change the old value for the new one. You want to have maybe the key repeated with a bunch of values. Perhaps that'll be easier to write the key only once and the value be an array or list of values in that case. But it's really up to you how to organize this part of the hash. So a key cannot be in different indexes, but inside one index, it's really down to how you implement that data structure. Some people would repeat the key three times, have giving it three different values. That's possible. <coughs> so a successful search is the key in there or Unsuccess search, meaning the key is not there. So we need a little bit of math to figure out how long does it take to search for a key in a hash. Right? We, we need a little bit of math to do that. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to say my hashing function has the property that the count of a particular index, j becoming h of a key. So in other words, how many keys hash to this position, some particular position here, j? That is and j out of n. n is the number of key value pairs. So out of n, how many of things map to j? You can interpret this easily as a probability, right? This is the probability that h of key equal index j. So I have it from zero to max. I'm counting how many keys can map to something. So what happens for a, a unsuccessful search? Let's assume H is uniform on zero max, which means what? The expected value of every nj things that map to j is right. 
How many? <coughs> if it's uniform, how many things do you expect to map into one location? So total number of elements n divided by which is how many? Right? Imagine this, suppose I have a million students and my max is 10,000. I only have a catalog of 10,000 things. Those million students go into 10,000 things. If the hashing is uniform, how many collisions there are per, for, for each slot? Roughly a million divided by 10,000, right? That means uniform number of collisions. Each one of them will have 100 collisions, which is, means a list roughly of length 100, right? So that's n by max. Um, there is this, we call this by definition, the books calls it alpha. So that's alpha, it's a hash ratio. That is how many things do you plan to put in your hash, divide by how, what's the size of the catalog. You sh this is the number of e collisions you expect if the hash function is uniform, right? If you put a million things into a hundred buckets and it's uniform, roughly you get a hundred items per bucket. If you put a million things into ten buckets, then you expect how many collisions per bucket? Hundred thousand. So th this is a constant from the be very beginning of the planning that's alpha is this ratio. Now what happens if it's unsuccessful search? Well, the key gonna get mapped into H of some H of key, right? That's all of one. And then that sum J, right, in my table. And the search will take expected of what, what's going to happen my search. I get to this and I start looking for to look for that key, right? And what's going to happen? I'm going to finish the list and not find the key. So through how many things I go? NJ. Right? Search is NJ. Uh, uh, steps. Because NJ is how many things got mapped in there. Right? In, in slot J. So it means on expectation, on average, I get the expected value of mj, which is alpha. So uh, this is theta of 1, right? And then so the total is theta of 1 plus alpha. Because all, no matter who j is, we expect this uh, values to be roughly the ratio, right, in a uniform thing. What happens in a successful search? It's a little bit more complicated. So this, that's a successful search. <laughs> But this is really more complicated than it needs to be. So we're going to do the intuition in class. And you guys can go home and read this. <coughs> uh, in a successful search, we need this uh, random variable, xij, uh, uh, which is, this is a random variable, is 1 if h of ki is equal to eight of k j. So uh, I should have used this. J is very different than this j. Let's call it something else. X u v. If k u is the same as k v, these are uh, some index of keys u and v, and zero if not. So this x u v says, do you have a collisions between keys u and v? You have two keys u and v. Are they hashing to the same thing or not? So here's what's going to happen here. The probability 
of x u v being one, meaning of a collision, is one over um, max. Is that true? Assuming a uniform hashing function, take two keys. What's the probability that they map to the same <coughs> index? Well, the first one will go somewhere. And the second one, what chance has the second one to go to the same spot? <coughs> the second one is uniform, so whatever the first one is, it's one over max to go in there. Right? So we, then the expected value of x, u, v, any binary random variable, the expected is, so the values are 0, 1, right? The expectation of it is 0 times probability of 0 plus 1 times probability of 1. So the expected will be probability of being 1. That's 1 over max. So the expectation of any binary random variable is the probability of being 1. OK? So now what's going to happen? Like here, my key will still hash to some h of key, which is, say, uh, j, <coughs> right? Um, so how long the search is going to take? How long the search is going to take? Search in list A of J, right? Because J is here. I got the hashing value. Now I have to go to the list to find the value, right? We'll take, if, if the value is there, value exists. This is a linear search, right? So on average, how long is going to take? Um, on average, it's going to take what? Half of the list or something like that, right? So here's what I'm going to have here. If this is going to take uh, one, I think that is the key factor. I'm going to say this is sum of some k here x So what do I want to say is I have my keys, right? So this is key 1, key 2, key uh, some n keys. And then I'm looking for all the keys, I think, before my key that I'm inserting here. coming from? X, K, J is what? 1 if they map to the same thing, 0 if not. So what's this sum going to be? Is the number of keys that map to the same as my key, right? So then, if, if I can write my search in this way, again, this is a sum of binary random variables. It's one for every key that hash to the same index as the current one I'm looking for. That is the size of that list that I'm going to search now. So the total here is one plus that sum, 
one coming from the from the hashing function, but then this has to be averaged. So that is one over n sum from i equal one to n. Uh, that's the case of one plus sum of x k j. Now, this is the first line in this mathematical derivation, but that's the only one that matters for you. The rest is very easy. Once you understand what this first line is coming from, this is pure arithmetic. So you, we can compute this. There's an expectation in front of it. So what happens, expectation distributes over everything, over the sums. This will be 1n sum of k equal 1 to n, 1 plus sum of the expectations. Uh, and then I, I know this value, this is say it's 1 over max, which in the end, you can read it from the notes, instead of again, 1 plus alpha. Uh, or if you like it better, n divided by max. <coughs> Moral of the story, this is more complicated. Both successful and unsuccessful searches have this time, which is 1 plus alpha. Most people, before taking this course, they think hashing is O of 1. Hashing is not O of 1. Maybe you can use a fancier structure than this list here. But you can see, if I have a million students crammed into a thousand index slots, what is my search going to be, successful or unsuccessful? This alpha is going to be a thousand, so it's roughly a thousand operations. Now, maybe I can design the hash differently. What if I have a hundred thousand max? Then alpha goes down, right, because it's n divided by max. So if the max increases, if I give it more memory, <coughs> it's typically faster to do it. And you should know this about hashes. This is a typical interview question. How do you speed up the search of a key in a hash? The me memory you give it, the less the size of the lists are going to be, right? The collision lists or structures. And then the search through those lists will happen faster. But the, what's the trade-off? You need a bigger catalog. If you shrink the catalog, what's going to happen? The list will get longer. And then the search in those lists, if you have collisions, will take more time. So it's a little bit of trade-off. Most people want to think if hashing is uniform, most people want to balance the size with the size of the list. So maybe if I have a million things, I would use a 10,000 catalog. And then the expected size of this list will be about 100 each. And I'm expecting, when I do a search, to go roughly through 100 things in this list, right? Because most collisions will be size 100. But you should be aware of this trade-off. If you, if you think, oh, I, I can use a lot more memory than 10,000. I have a big memory machine. But I'm not happy with searching through 100 things for every single lookup. Then what do I do? I increase the catalog from 10,000 to half a million. And then the size of the list becomes roughly two. Much faster than 100 but then I have to use a bigger catalog. So be careful, because this was many times a variation of this is an interview question. How do you design a smaller? What's the trade-off if your catalog hash is smaller? The search through the list is bigger. Okay. So what's left? What else do we need to implement hashes? We have this theory. We understand the catalog. You got to store the key and the value somehow. This will be a Java object or a Python object or something that stores. Uh, I think your homework is words and counts. So you hash the words, and then you get uh, a key. You store objects that are both the word and its count. And you, you have to count the words in a piece of text or something like that. What else we don't have yet? We don't have a hash function, right? We need a hash function. We need to take a memory representation of words or names or IDs, whatever it is, and transform it to an integer. Uh, let's assume the max is given. 
what would be a very, very easy hash function? F of some memory. I'm going to say this key in memory representation. That's an integer. That is the integer I've been thinking before when I didn't do hashing, right? I can take that key as an integer by reading the bits and make an integer out of it. That's nothing wrong with it mathematically. It's just a big integer. Mm -hmm. 2 to the 256, if I'm not careful. The problem is storing it, not thinking about it. I can think of big integers, right? So I don't want to store that as an index. I want to transform it. But for the transformation purposes, I'm going to assume that's an integer. So what's an easy, natural way to say, OK, take any big integer that you might have and make it be between 0 and max? Modulo. Modulo, right? I can say, OK, that is whatever integer you have, let's say the key as an integer, modulo. Technically, it would be modulo what to get from 0 to max? max. Or max plus 1. But we'll skip that detail. We'll say mod max. Technically, this will not never give me max. The maximum value you get of modulo is? Max minus, minus, minus 1. So this would be max minus 1, the maximum value. It won't matter for implementation. Nice. That's a good function. It's a. Uh, it's one in here. Uh, if we do this, so this is called the division method. Are we taking care of business here? What were our, our desired properties? We have to be between 0 and max. Is that true? We have to distribute well. We have to distribute well. Right. So if the keys are uniform integers, even if they're very big, uniform integers, are they going to distribute well across the max? Yes. Uniform integers distribute uniformly over modulo. But big integers are not uniform. That's beyond the scope of this class. So it matters who max is. There's good max for distribution purposes. Good max and bad max. Bad max is approximately a power of 2. So taking max, what you normally take, 64, bad for distribution. Good max, it's not close to a power of 2. So the book suggests max of 701. How is that compared to powers of 2? What are the, the left and right powers of 2? 512 and 124. This is reasonably in the middle between powers of 2. So there's beyond the scope of this class. It has to do a lot of uh, with, with, with the law, law of large numbers, things like that. Fancy statistics, so to speak. Why is it that that integers, big integers, if you get memory representation for things like Virgil the phone number, they don't happen to be uniformly distributed in that <coughs> range. And then they're not going to be distributed nice so over by thinking modulo to max. I want to put here another function that the book has. There are many functions, and in the homework you can design your own. You can design any, any mapping you want. The other one, multiplicative, is this. H of a key is take the key, multiply with the value A. Uh, this says mod 1. I don't like mod 1 as a notation. Mod 1 means take the rational part. This is a real value. The rational part, how do I take the rational if I want, what's the rational of 1.257? What's the rational part of it? 0 0.257. So how do I get the rational part of a, of a real, this is a real number. 
I have to subtract the integer part. What's the integer part? In there it's one, but in here this could be any real number. How do I subtract the integer part? Take the floor of it, right? The book again calls it take this modulo one, as in by division to one you get rational part. I think that's a terrible way to think of the rational part. I'd much rather in my head think of take the real value and subtract the integer value out of it. Right? So you got that, and then you multiply with the max. And then you take again some floor or something. So how this work? So here's an example. Uh, key is one, two, three, four, five, six. Memory representation happens to be this integer. A is there's a People's, very smart people thinking how to pick this A constant here. <coughs> so A in here is 2, 6, 5, 4, 4, 3, 5, 7, 6, 9. Divide to 2 to the 32. And then max is to the 14. In here, there's no problem with max being the power of 2. It's actually recommended max to be a power of 2. And you can follow these notes to see what the resulting index is. Right. The book presents not just the technique, but a, fan, a, a quick way to do this operation. If you pay attention to how the bits get represented, you get a fast operation so the, the hashing can happen really fast. You should be aware that if hashing function includes fancy operations, we risk what danger? Not being all one. So it's easy to say take mod, take logarithm, take this, do that. But is it really all of one at the end? Because hashing happens a lot when you use hashes. Like lots, lots, lots of hashes. You want to be a fast operation. Of course, we want to satisfy distribution property and the max properties, but we don't want a function that takes time, then every time we need to compute it, then we run into trouble. So we're going to talk a little bit more about hash tables, but your main job is to implement hash tables and then run a hash table as count for text with your own uh, implementation. Um, I'll do another QA next time in class, and office hours today, Wednesday, and maybe Friday. I expect most people will not look at hashes until Saturday. So, um, just in case it's not clear, the midterm is designed for about four hours, three, four hours, but we give more time to the students. You're going to have extra time. Uh, it's up to you roughly how much time you have within limits. We're not going to stay overnight. Uh, <laughs> most people like to prepare for longer. I mean, you're welcome to come prepare for four hours, like we start what time? Then, if you want to set a date for 2 p.m., you can do that. But you may regret it during the exam. Oh, my God, I set my date at 2 p.m. That's not a good idea. If I were you, I would book the day for it. Like. Let's assume we don't know exactly when it's going to end. And prepare that way in terms of food. Like you may want to bring a sandwich to have it later on. But coffee and things like that. You will have bathroom breaks, but not food breaks. Like if you say, I'm hungry, I need to go an hour and a half and come back. <laughs> That's not possible. Okay. So I would, I would, you are welcome to say, sorry, I have to go by two. I have a date, I have an appointment. You can do that. But if I were you, I would try to have the day free just in case I need more time for the exam. Okay. So I'll see you again on Friday.